our review of Acts chapter 9, for which our focus has been a chosen instrument and the preparation of Saul to become an instrument of the Lord. Have you ever thought of yourself as having been created to be an instrument of the Lord? For the most part, we think in terms of when I become a Christian, that I'm to live out the Christian creed. We are mindful of forgiveness, sometime of mercy, repentance, joy, wisdom. redemption but we don't always think in terms of discipleship creating disciples the opportunity that we are given to create disciples When we think in terms of the role of being an instrument, an instrument of God's righteousness, the first order of business is to be mindful that we are called to be disciple makers. You've heard me say before, not all of us are called to be preachers and teachers. Not all of us are called to sing, but we're all called to be witnesses. Being a witness is the, the generic essence, not some faraway formula, the generic essence of who it is we are, to be a witness, to bring forth the good news of the gospel. And what it has done in my life. You know, that my life has changed as a result of taking on a new life. And that's what salvation represents, a new life. As Paul says, I'm a new creation in Christ. I will be mindful that Christ died for me, that I would live for him. And in order for me to do that, I must die to myself. And not just at the advent of salvation, but from salvation thereon. Daily, I die to myself. Because if not, it's going to be impossible for me to be an instrument if I'm doing my own thing. And of course, doing my own thing is very easy because I've been living with me all of my life. <laughs> I have my idiosyncrasies. I have things that I believe to be valuable and some things not. But when I come to Christ, that agenda is surrendered to him. And then what he does, he begins to work in us. Now we talked last week about, well, Saul. Saul didn't go through the process of the Lord being his savior as Jesus is for us. He's, my, he's our savior and salvation didn't cost me anything. And then he begins to work in us the process of sanctification where he becomes my Lord. Are you with me still? Salvation is a free gift. He's my savior. But him becoming my Lord cost me me. But we saw in the case of Paul from, for, look here, from the advent of salvation, Paul said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And Paul began to live for the Lord. We're going to look at that some more 
this morning. But I wanted us to be mindful of the process and what it means to be a chosen instrument. See, when you, when you hear chosen instrument, you might think it only applied to Saul and to Peter and to John and to Moses and to Abraham. No, it applies to each of us. We're going to look at the seven steps, okay, of, 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 of being on mission with God. The first one is the fact that we were chosen. And the scripture says we were chosen before the foundation of the earth. We were chosen. All right? So, we're going to look at Saul. Remember, last week, we had the snapshot of him and what he had undergone and what he was about to go through. And the Lord made clear to Ananias that he was, Saul was a chosen vessel and he was going to show him all that he would have to go through for his namesake. And remember, we covered the whole, I mean, three quarters of the service last week was focus on his namesake. Because always in these scriptures, as we are reading the scriptures, the scriptures denote history. But the scriptures is also very applicable to our lives, which is present today. We want to take scripture, we want to read it, we want to see the history, we want to discuss it, but we also want to, you know, to see the parallel to our own lives. And the Lord said to, to Ananias, I'm going to show him what he has to go through for my name. And the scripture says namesake. In other words, what you do for the Lord. We have to be mindful of that. Okay? Because of the Lord. Look here. We live. We live and we carry his name. And we to be mindful of that. All right? Are you with me? We are chosen instruments. Well, let's look at the scripture. The focus is chapter um, 9, of course, verses 17 through 22. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Now remember, this is with disciples, not the apostles. All right? You with me? At once he began to preach in the synagogues. <laughs> that Jesus is the son of God. I can't help but laugh. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the man? You know, that's like uh, when it came time for the Super Bowl and you had Tampa in Kansas City and the quarterback from Kansas City said, I'm no longer going to play on my team. I'm coming to play with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah. Satan. It's like Satan himself <laughs> have decided he's going to defend God. Isn't that something? You can imagine the consternation that this caused among the people. But think about what was going on in Saul. Here's a man who his whole, I mean his existence has been to destroy. And now he is to defend. Isn't he, and this is what folks say, all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who are called on this name? 
And hasn't he come here to take them to, as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. You know, initially when you read this, as I said many times, you kind of just read it and just keep going. But we need to stop. We need to stop and just look and ask the Lord to help us with look here, the revelatory content and to see this through his eyes because a lot is going on. Imagine the comfort that it gave to Saul for Ananias to come and lay hands upon him and call him brother. Look here, do you think that did something to Saul? Let's go back. Look, look what he said. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul. Let me ask you something. If somebody had done you the kind of things that we do to, to one another, particularly in these days, and now you got that individual in such a vulnerable position where he can't see, he hasn't eaten, clearly he's weakened, and you have an opportunity to chop his head off. You have an opportunity to get rid of this man that has caused so much habit. And instead, you go to him and you call him brother. And you pray for him. And you lay hands upon him. Why would Ananias do such a thing? Think about that for a moment. Would you have been capable of that? Have you ever had to deal with someone who persecuted you? Someone who treated you bad? Someone who sit back and said that you ain't nothing, you can't do nothing? Or someone who lied upon you and said things? I mean, have you ever been in this position? I don't know about you, but I have. And I can remember asking the Lord to help me. Help me to deal with this situation the way he dealt with it with me. You see, because if you think that you've never had to deal with this situation, understand that Jesus has had to deal with it a lot. And guess where he dealt with it? He dealt with it with you. Because you were not born saved. None of us here were born saved. All of us here had to come via the path of grace and mercy and forgiveness. Every one of us. So if you had to give it to somebody, you're not giving it to someone that you yourself didn't get. Can I get an amen? amen? But we see that Ananias received the Lord's instruction. We saw last week that Ananias had a little argument with the Lord for a moment until the Lord says, nope. Nope. I've chosen him as a vessel. And because the Lord spoke it, that settled it with Ananias. Christians or Christianity in its essence and the foundation is forgiveness. Christianity, in its essence, in the very foundation, is forgiveness. Now let me ask you something. Do you struggle with it? <laughs> yes, yes we do, don't we? But that doesn't make it right. It simply means that you need some work. And let me tell you where the work comes from. 
The work does not come from, yes, I am, I, I am, I am, I think I can. Or, no, it does not come from affirmation. It comes through repentance. It comes through you getting on your knees and crying out to the Lord and say, Lord, I can't do this on my own. In our study today with the men, Roland had me to fill in. And we opened up in chapter 3 of James. And it spoke about the tongue. And it spoke about the things that follows the tongue. But what we were clearly able to see, that nothing comes via the tongue without coming from the heart. And the heart is the matter. It's a matter of the heart. We have heart issues. We have severe heart issues. I said that there are times in our lives that you might call us fault finders. And when we do that, we have gotten off of the path of righteousness. And we're no longer aligned with God. And I spoke with them, aligned with him and his righteousness and his forgiveness and his mercy. We jump on the bag wagon with the posse. And I made, it, I, look at, I made it clear to them why I use the word posse. Because posse simply means that I'm following something that's not of the Christian walk. I'm following something that Galatians 5 and 19 says, those things are not of God. Ananias reflected or was very reflective of who God is in him. Now remember what we said about Ananias when you go back and read verses 10 through 16. It speaks about Ananias being a man of much prayer. Let me ask you about your prayer life. What's it like? Is it anemic? Is it blusterous? Is it powerful? Is it weak? How much time do you spend in prayer? Do you pray on the go where you're going and just assume that that's okay? Do you tell the Lord what you want, then you hang up the phone where you don't get the replies of what he wants? See, we have all of these things in our lives that we need to be mindful of. And the reason being, <laughs> I no longer belong to me. I belong to him. And if I belong to him, I should be hearing what it is he has to say. I need to be mindful that I am a chosen instrument. And what it means to be chosen. I mean, everybody want to be part of a team, don't we? Of course. But you know how easy it is to get aligned with the posse? You know how easy it is? It's very easy because you know what? Usually what the posse has going is fleshly things. Retribution. Judgment. Condemnation. You know one of the things I love about the Lord? Is when he got to deal with me when I've done something dumb. When I've done something out and look at pastors do dumb things. You hear them telling you. Yeah, look at, just check the word. Check Moses. Moses. Moses did a dumb thing when he decided to do what he did to the rock versus speaking to it. Check David out. David did a dumb thing when he had to go over there and deal with Bathsheba. But how he dealt with his children. Pastor Charles used to say we were, all of us are one step from stupid. And we are. But isn't it good that we have a father who loves us, a spirit of the living God who sits inside of us and is ready to direct our path? Amen. Ananias. We see what has occurred between Saul 
and Ananias, men who were bitter enemies. Men who were bitter enemies came together as brothers. You see, there's hope for us. There is. But that hope comes about when I allow him to be my guide. I'll allow him to be my strength. I'll allow him to be my hope. I allow him to do those things in me that only he can do. Last week I spoke to you about, about when I go to Coleman prison or when I go to the county jail, when I'm speaking to inmates, I want to make sure they understand that the gospel is about being free on the inside. Though you may be enclosed behind these walls, the Lord's intent is once you receive the gospel, you are free on the inside. Though you have these walls that incarcerate you, though you have these bars that incarcerate you, you are still free on the inside when you have received the gospel of Jesus Christ. But so it is for those who are free like we think we are. Because a lot of us don't have any walls to incarcerate us. A lot of us don't have bars to incarcerate us. But you know what we are not? We are not free on the inside. When I'm free on the inside, I do the things that are pleasing to God. Amen. Often Bible stories discussed and reviewed, the discussions focus on the failure of great actions of individuals at the center of the story. Yeah, we hear about the great feats of John, Apostle John, and Apostle Peter. Yeah, the things that were going on. But we've heard some stories in these last six, seven weeks about people just like us. We've heard about Stephen. And how we, the church, owe Stephen some gratitude. Because, because Stephen prayed, Lord, forgive them for what they did. They know not what they've done. Forgive them. Paul was forgiven, and Paul, or Saul, is now being used. We heard about Stephen. We heard about Philip. And how the Lord used him right in the height of this great move of God in Samaria. The Spirit of God spoke to him and led him on the path, that, the, a path that was leaf travel to speak to the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch received the gospel of Jesus Christ. And look here, was baptized and took the word of God up the coast to North Africa. And, and, and we see how they were changed. And now we come to again a man that we know very little of by the name of Ananias. Not the Ananias and Sapphira that got into trouble, but this is a man, the Bible says, who prayed. He believed God. And because he was, hey, look here, because he was intimately in love with God. That the Lord was able to speak to him and he heard it. And he went to a man who for all practical reasons didn't deserve any of what Ananias showed to him. Ananias understood that he was an extension of God. So does that mean that if I'm a chosen instrument, that I understand 
that on any given day, at any given moment, in any given situation, that I can be an instrument of God. Ooh. Wow. Wow. Maybe that's why the Lord sent his spirit to live inside of me. Yeah. So I can be an instrument of God that I can show mercy as the Lord does. That I can exhibit grace as he does. That I can act in wisdom because I got the gift of discernment that I cannot condemn someone because God has a role for that very individual to play to glorify him. Remember last week we covered Revelation 4 and 11 that says all things were created for God's glory and his pleasure. And we come to understand when does the Lord experience pleasure out of my life? He does when I'm doing the things he created me to do. And one of the things he created me to do was to glorify him, was to worship him, was to sing his praises. Can I get an amen? amen. Mm, mm, mm. An instrument. I want to draw attention to three men, Stephen, Philip, and Ananias. I wonder did either, look here, I wonder that is it either or either. I always get that mixed up because when, look here, when we were getting English classes in high school and college, I was playing football. So is it, is it either or either? Which one? Is it either or? I like that, either or. I like it. Come on, Ken, use any one you want to. But I wonder did any of them ever think that my obedience will speak for thousands of years to bring about hope in the Lord's people concerning what obedience manifest because it was through Stephen and Philip and, and look at Ananias obedience these were look at these were men who were considered obscure you look here you, you know you didn't see them coming and they showed up and then they were gone but they were significant because the Lord used them so it is with us that's why I say when we, look at when we were going through this service to ask yourself, look, the, how does this history in God's word apply to me? I always have to look at it to see how does this parallel in my own life? You see, because this is timeless and timely. The word of God is timely and timeless. And, it, and look here, if, if I dig in, if I allow the Spirit of God to work in me, each story I read, there's going to be some parallel in it in terms of my life. What it is the Lord has for me on this given day. Can I get an amen? I want to share something with you. On April 21, 1855, Edward Kimbo led one of his Sunday school boys to faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> this faraway place here in America, they have Sunday school. And he leads this young man to Christ. Little did he realize 
that that young man was Dwight L. Moody. Yeah. Imagine that. Do you think Mr. Kimball had any inclinations that this young man that he led to Christ would be used to become one of the greatest evangelists, uh, look at evangelists in the history of man? See, we don't know. But it's important that we understand being an instrument of the Lord. I'm mindful of this assignment. I'm looking out. But you know, with, look, look here. With just these eyes and these ears, I can only see and hear so far. But with a heart of God, and to pursue him, and to seek after him, And to be obedient. There's a pretty good opportunity to be a disciple maker where the disciples that you look at the Lord use you to bring into the kingdom can change the world. And, and look here, and it may be in just a little place just like this. One of the things I struggled with at First Baptist that time, and though I got to preach sermons there on Sunday at First Baptist, but some of my greatest sermons, some of my greatest teachings, not mine, how the Lord used me, was on Wednesday night. I mean, there were moments on Wednesday night that just shuttered the blinds. I'm telling you, where the Spirit of God just shook the place up. And I used to always say, Lord. <laughs> but see, this was the ego in me. Lord, how are you moving like this in the midst? And the only people that hear it, the little people that's in here. You know, he never answered me. You know what he was saying to me? Shut up, boy. Shut up. Shut up, because if you're faithful with a little, I will give you a lot. But I don't want you looking for it, because if you begin to look for it, you're going to stop looking to me. Because, oh, by the way, Ken, it ain't you. It's me. You're just an instrument. I learned from it, and here we are now. You know what I've learned after all of those years? To love him. And that each time I come to preach, to teach, to serve, I'm doing it as this, I'm doing it before the Lord. He's here watching me. Because you know why? He is. See, in everything that we do, we must desire that he be our audience. Can I get an amen? That he be our audience. Hmm. It's a ministry also by the gentleman by the name of Norman B. Harrison. He too. He did a Bible conference. And at the Bible conference there was a man by the name of Theodore Epps. And when you get home, look up Theodore Epps. The, the, Theodore Epps. And you know who he was? He was the one who, look here, who set up back to the Bible ministry that encircled the globe. Back to the Bible. When you go home, look it up and see. Again, look. The teacher, Mr. Harrison, the one who did the conference, he probably had no clue that Theodore Epps was in there. But you know, he did it as if he was doing it before the Lord. We never know who we're going to encounter. We don't know. But here's what we do know. 
as I was sitting back here, I was reminded of the scripture in Luke 14, I think Luke 4 and 18, it says that Jesus stood up and came up to the podium and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel, to teach his word, and to set the captives free. And I say, Lord, that's the anointing that I want. That's what I desire when I come to preach and to teach. I desire that there, each heart here be made pliable to receive what the Lord, what the Spirit of God is pouring out of me. I studied to show myself approved. I put this together, but after that, it's up to him. It's up to him. And what I love about preaching and teaching the gospel, on one side it might be cold, but on the other side it may be hot. On one side there may be conviction. On the other side it may be great encouragement. But that's the way the word of God is. This is what we want. We want to do it so that it is pleasing to him to pray. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. Look what he says. Prayer is the autograph of the Holy Spirit upon the renewed heart. Ooh. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Listen to it again. Prayer is the autograph of the Holy Spirit upon the renewed heart. Praying. I'm a new creation, and my life source is the Lord God Almighty. Why do I pray? Because pray acknowledge that he's God and I'm not. Prayer humbles me before him to say to him that I need you. I dare not do this on our own. See, our task is to lead men and women to Christ. God's task is to use them for his glory, and every person is important to God. Every one of us, every child of God. You've heard me say that when a human being rejects salvation and steps out of time into eternity, and he's going to spend eternity in darkness, it grieves God because his likeness and his image has gone on into darkness. We haven't got to Paul yet, but y'all know we're going to get to Saul. We're going to talk about him because there's a lot to discuss about him. But I wanted to spend some time speaking about these three men that we've read and we've seen how God used them. Think about this for a moment. The Lord didn't send Ananias to go in there and there'd be a big revival where thousands came like he did with Philip. He didn't use him as he did with Stephen to challenge the Sanhedrin and all of his people and to cry out to God and to see Jesus standing. But he used this man called Ananias because he was a prayer, because he sought the Lord to lay hands upon a man that the Lord was going to use. To me, there's little difference between Stephen Philip and Ananias. But it's something for each of us to glean from each of them. Because what made them children of God is the fact 
that each of them were instruments of God. As each of us are. Scripture tells us that God is no respecter of persons. You've heard me say time and time again, there are those who say that I'm kind of, I'm kind of loquacious and sometimes I boast about who I am in God. You know what? Let me tell you something. It's like Paul said, if I boast about anything, I boast about him. I boast about my daddy. I boast about the lineage that I have. And if I offend you, I'm sorry. But I'm speaking righteousness. I understand who I am. The scripture says those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. And if I'm a child of God, it means I'm an heir of God, joint heirs with Jesus, whereby I decry Abba. I know who I am. And that makes a difference. Do you know who you are? I'm chosen. I am chosen. We're chosen. The seven steps of being on mission with God is that first we understand that we were chosen. Then we were called. And then the Lord established a covenant with us. And then he equips us. Mm -hmm. Then he sends us. He says go. Then he guides us to the place where he wants us to be. And number seven, he uses us. Next week, I'm going to give you the scriptures associated with those seven steps. Folks, all too often, when people of God are in the midst of a battle, we miss the view of the big picture. Because the war has already been won, though we're undergoing battles. And if the battle tarries, or if it appears as if you're losing, you're not. Because the battle, the war itself has been won. And the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. I'm just to remember that I am a chosen instrument. How about you? I know I can say to you without a doubt <laughs> that Ken Scrubs from 205 George Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, a little boy born who didn't have much of anything, a little boy who folks said would never amount to anything, a little boy who was put down time and time again because he was poor. But there's one thing that separated me from all the other stuff that was said to me. They told me about a God in heaven And I came to call out to that God that I heard about. <laughs> and when I did, he answered. And he told me I was his. And there have been times I've fallen in potholes. There have been times where it looked like I was lost. But it was in those times that he was nearest to me. Because he knew there was a time coming that I would understand what it means to love him. And in gathering that understanding, I would be able to love those that are created in his image and his likeness more with the God kind of love. We are chosen instruments. The Lord has called us to do. And one of the things I've learned that the Lord is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, 
over and above what we can ask or even phantom. This is what Paul spoke in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. He was speaking about us and about who our Father is. Amen. Amen. Next week we're going to get in to speak about Saul and his transformation. Because some says that it was, in fact, the greatest transformation in the history of man. And you know what? I agree. And it's our example. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for using me this day. I thank you, Father God, for on the days for which I struggle, in the days for which I missed the mark, you were there to call to me what I should, what I could do through you, and to move away from my flesh I thank you, Father God, that even in your corrections, we're not condemned. You're calling us higher. You want our roots to run deeper into you. Just as we've declared, Father God, that humility is the soil for which grace is rooted. For you give grace to the humble. And for he who humbles himself, Father God, you will exalt him. I pray, Father God, for this house. I pray, Father God, for my brothers and sisters that are here today, that they've heard your glorious and wonderful gospel. It's been edified in them by the power of the Spirit of God that lives inside of us. And I pray that it will bear abundant fruit. I pray that your glorious and wonderful presence, your hand, would be firmly upon this church, that you would bless it indeed. You would increase our borders of righteousness and keep us from sin so that we will not cause pain. You did it for Jabez. Do it for us. I've prayed, Father God, that those who are members here will begin to return back to this fellowship. But Lord, we send out your glorious and wonderful blessings, your mercy and your grace. Strengthen us. In the days ahead, we pray that we will seek your face because you assured us that as we seek you, we shall find you. As we knock, the door shall be opened. As we ask, it shall be given unto us. And Lord, Father God in heaven, we desire to have more of you. We love you, Father God. Of one another. In Jesus' glorious and wonderful name we pray and all said together, Amen. Amen. God bless you, saints. Be in prayer. Pray for the Lord's best for all of us. Pray for America. Pray for the church. Amen. And shall see you next week.